Tonight, fly the war-torn skies of Europe with Hitler's mighty Luftwaffe. In 1943, Nazi Germany launched history's first real terror weapon, the V-1 flying bomb. Aimed at civilian targets across England, this new weapon firmly established a new kind of warfare and a new reign of terror. Tonight, fly with the elite airmen of the Third Reich on wings of the Luftwaffe. In its day, it was the most fearsome weapon imaginable. Falling from the skies with unparalleled fury, it caused death and destruction far out of proportion to its size. The Nazis called it their vengeance weapon. Its legacy was man's first glimpse of a grim future as hostage to nuclear terror. Launched with a powerful steam catapult from slotted steel rails about 150 feet long, V-1s rained on their targets from distant camouflaged sites in Normandy and East Prussia. A tube with a reaction chamber and a short steel piston was mounted underneath the platform's narrow track. A device called a starter trolley shot gas into the tube, which in turn propelled the piston forward. The piston was equipped with a lug which protruded through the track slot and was attached to the V1. In three quarters of a second, the V-1 was accelerated to nearly 250 miles an hour. This launch assembly, brought to England at the end of World War II, is now exhibited at the Imperial War Museum in Duxford. Powered by an unorthodox pulse jet propulsion system, the rocket's simple airframe and stubby wings bore a large warhead. Guided by an unpredictable autopilot, its inaccuracy made it all the more terrifying. From safe havens on the continent, the V-1, or more accurately, the Fiesler FI-103, made killing a cold and detached exercise. For the first time, people in a foreign land could be destroyed by remote control. The V-1 led to a plethora of Nazi missiles. Henschel's air-launched HS-293 air-to-ground missile was one of the most advanced to see combat. Rocket propelled and radio controlled, it was visually guided from its carrier aircraft to the target. Impact speeds varied between 270 and 560 miles an hour. But the most frightening was the awesome V2, and by far the most formidable. Weighing over 14 tons with a range of nearly 200 miles, it bore its one-ton warhead at a top speed of 3,400 miles an hour. Anti-aircraft weapons such as the Rheintochter or Rheindaughter were also developed. The X-4 became the first air-to-air -air missile for the new jet. The Rheinbotter or Rhein Messenger was a multi-stage rocket that delivered its warhead over a distance of 100 miles Traveling at nearly 3,800 miles an hour, it was the fastest machine yet known to man. By the outbreak of war, German rocketry boasted a long heritage of experimentation and government support. By 1930, work by men like Klaus Riedel, Rudolf Nebel, and Kurt Heinisch led the world. Their endeavors were soon followed by the contributions of Werner von Braun and Hermann Oberth probably history's most significant names in the evolution of the rocket. Peripheral yet vital was the work of men like Raymond Tilling. His liquid fuel Tilling rocket, equipped with retractable wings for recovery, was successfully tested in 1932. Launched from a tripod-mounted tube, it never soared over a thousand feet, but was nonetheless state-of-the-art for the time and a vital stepping stone on the road of development. When this rocket reached its zenith and all fuel was burnt, the wings would spring out and the device would spiral back to Earth for recovery. It was hoped it could carry mail across short distances. A year after this test flight, Tilling would be killed when a rocket exploded during launch.
Gerhard Zucker also championed the postal rocket concept. In 1935, Zucker launched this large rocket in Germany following the launch of a smaller prototype in Scotland. In Britain, it was branded a risk to public safety. Zucker's rocket fared no better in his native Germany. The HS-293, one of the many heirs to Germany's rocket legacy, was part of a large family of air-to-surface weapons developed by Henschel. Powered by a Volta 109 liquid propellant rocket, the missile consisted of an SC-500 bomb with aft fuselage and wings attached. The Volta 109 rocket pod had internal tanks for the propellants, D-stoff or hydrogen peroxide and Z-stoff or sodium permanganate. The engine generated over 1,300 pounds of thrust for about 10 seconds, adding about 120 miles an hour to the missile's launch velocity. It was released between 1,300 and 6,560 feet at ranges from target varying from about 2 to 11 miles. The rocket pod was fueled up before being attached to the missile. Here, what is probably an HS-293D model, is prepared for test launching from a Heinkel HE-111H. In 1944, the weapon was trialed as an anti-shipping measure. Some 70 missiles were expended in attempts to perfect its accuracy and dependability. Surprisingly, like today's smart bombs, this version of the Henschel missile was equipped with a nose-mounted television camera for remote sensing and targeting. Conical drag bodies attached to the wingtips were used to reduce the missile's speed so that it would not fly beyond its structural capabilities and disintegrate in midair. Though most HS-293s were remotely controlled via radio transmissions, some were equipped with a backup wire guidance system physically linking launch aircraft and missile. Thin wire trailed behind, connecting it to a controller almost 19 miles away. Controller and joystick were mounted in the aircraft's cockpit. Missile control surfaces were guided by moving or rotating the stick on the Kale transmitter. As there was no rudder, only the missile's pitch and roll were affected. The HS-293 could be carried by any number of Luftwaffe combat planes, including the rarely seen Heinkel HE-177. Mounted on the big bomber's centerline, the guided missile was normally launched between 7 and 18 miles from target. A bright flare attached to its tail enabled the German pilots to maintain visual contact in bringing the deadly weapon onto target. This particular version was equipped with wingtip bobbins, trailing a thin pair of wires back to the attacking plane. This form of control was later discarded in favor of a conventional radio contact. Although this proved highly susceptible to electronic jamming by Allied forces. Henschel's HS 298V2, with its bizarre protruding warhead, was a spin off of the company's first air to air missile, the HS 298V1. The earlier HS 298 was stubbier and reversed the positioning of the warhead and control system generator and propeller. The warhead tripped upon contact with its target. The weapon was propelled by a Schmidding 109 solid fuel rocket engine, generating up to 330 pounds of thrust. Maximum range was about one and a half miles. Nearly 1900 prototype HS-293s were built and their success encouraged Henschel and the Luftwaffe to pursue production and put the rocket to the acid test of combat. Numerous problems were encountered. Low temperatures often inhibited the missile's control and propulsion systems. As it was difficult to observe following launch, a special flare unit was attached to the tail for visual tracking. Once launched, the missile screamed ahead of the aircraft under the force of the Valter rocket engine generating only 10 seconds of thrust. 
With no fuel, it continued in a long, remote-controlled glide. The first HS-293 combat sortie took place on August the 25th, 1943, when Dornier DO-217s launched several of the missiles in an attack on Allied destroyers in the Bay of Biscay. Results were mixed. However, two days later, an enemy corvette was blasted by the missiles and sunk. Limited use of the weapon continued until the war's end, and it was only nominally effective. The final HS-293 mission of the war came during an attack on bridges across the Oder River in April 1945. The HS-293 was demanding. The missile's temperature had to be kept within a fixed range, using a warm air hose system attached to the aircraft carrying it. Upon reaching the target zone, the plane's transmitter was set to the missile's receiver and the gyroscope was set. Once the target was sighted, the attacking pilot circled it to give the crewman controlling the missile a good line of sight. After launch, the release button on the bomb sight was pressed, disconnecting the missile from its umbilicals to the parent craft. After free-falling for a single second, the weapon's remote control unit kicked in. The crewman back in the plane then fired the Valta rocket and directed it in its final deadly flight. The X-4 was the first high-performance air-to-air missile employed by jet fighters, intended for use by the Messerschmitt Me-262. Constraints on size and weight dictated that the weapon, its BMW 109 rocket engine and its spirally wound propellant tubes should be extraordinarily compact designs. Many of the propellants used in German missile engines were highly toxic and usually hypergolic meaning that when the two components came in contact with one another, they ignited, sometimes with catastrophic results. The small Walter 109 rocket engine used in the HS-293 used T-Stoff and Z-Stoff propellants, generating over 1,300 pounds of thrust for up to 10 seconds. It was a powerfully efficient booster. The 132-pound X-4, here suspended from the wing of an FW-190, had a range of about two miles and a maximum speed of over 700 miles an hour. But limited production of the BMW rocket engine effectively eliminated this missile as a real threat to the Allied cause, even though nearly 1,500 X-4 airframes were completed. During testing, the X-4 was launched from the Junkers Ju-88 and 388 and the Focke-Wulf FW-190. Discernible during this launch from a Ju-88 is its peculiar self-stabilizing one revolution per second flight characteristic. The missile was wirelink controlled by a transmitter and receiver. Pitch and yaw commands were sent by varying the electrical current's intensity transmitted through wires played out from the missile's wingtip. Like the 293, target aiming was visual and guided by a joystick mounted in the parent craft. The small 44-pound warhead was detonated either upon impact or by a sensing apparatus called the Miser Acoustic Proximity Fuse. This unusual device literally ignited the warhead when its microphone detected the sound of the target and determined it to be within 50 feet. Another missile meant to down aircraft, this time from the ground, was Rheinmetall Borsig's Rheintochter. With a four-nozzle booster unit, the Rheintochter was a sophisticated weapon intended for high-altitude intercepts. 
divided into two rocket stages, it was controlled by the paddle-like canards near the nose. All other surfaces were fixed stabilization devices. The missile was a complex machine that required a large launch apparatus. The launch rail and its support assemblies were portable, but only with great effort. Prior to launch, the missile was pointed towards its target. Once aloft, it was tracked visually. The short cylindrical booster had six highly swept wing-like fins. In early versions, six exhaust nozzles were equally spaced around a central nozzle, and the propellant, like that for the upper stage, was solid diglycol. In later missiles, the booster utilized liquid propellants. Maximum speed in both cases varied between 650 and 800 miles an hour, although the ceiling of the more advanced model at nearly 50,000 feet was about 30,000 feet higher than its predecessor. The Rheintochter was not a successful weapon. Some 82 of the early versions were launched during the test program beginning in 1942. By December of 1944, the project had been terminated. The more advanced missile, referred to as the R-111, with its liquid propellant booster, was a stronger performer. But by the time of its arrival in combat, it was already hopelessly outdated. There were eight major rocket engines in widespread use throughout the Reich. The most important of these were the BMW, the Schmidding, and the Walter 109 series engines. At Pienemunde, the powerful new rocket engine for the V-2 missile was developed. All of these units proved relatively rugged, dependable, and simple to manufacture and operate. There were essentially 10 propellant options for these engines. A stoff was liquid oxygen. B stoff, gasoline. C stoff, a mixture of hydrazine hydrate and methyl alcohol. M stoff, methanol. R stoff, or Tonka 250, a mixture of xylidine and triethylamine. SZ stoff, nitric acid. T-stoff, hydrogen peroxide, Z-stoff, calcium permanganate. Visol was vinyl isobutyl ether, and Vasag-61 was a solid propellant. Henschel's HS-117 Schmetterling, or Butterfly, surface-to-air anti-aircraft missile, used two solid-fuel rocket booster units for initial acceleration during launch. These engines, with 3,850 pounds of thrust, were mounted above and below the fuselage. They burned out a mere four seconds after ignition and were then automatically ejected. At this time, the main engine, fueled by liquid propellants and mounted in the missile's tail, took over. It was actually launched from a 37 millimeter gun mount assembly. With boosters, the missile reached 680 miles an hour but once these burned out, the butterfly dropped to its normal cruising speed of 590 miles an hour. Meant for low and medium altitude interception, the HS-117 was visually directed onto target by a ground controller using a magnification sighting scope. Two operators handled the interception. One tracked the target through the scope while the other controlled the missile with a joystick. They guided the weapon by radio link the missile's warhead could be manually commanded to detonate at any time during flight. The HS-117 was even used in tandem with early German radar systems in attempts to track remotely and destroy enemy aircraft. It was a glimpse into the future. But it wasn't terribly successful and no targets are known to have actually been shot down. Like many other Nazi surface-to-air missiles, in spite of the fact that hundreds were built, the HS-117 never made it into battle. Of those Nazi missiles that did make it into battle, 
The most infamous by far was the awesome V-2, the world's first operational ballistic missile. Ironically, it originated as a response to the weapons limitations imposed on Germany by the Treaty of Versailles. Work on rockets and missiles was embarked upon in the early 1930s. And this led to the Third Reich's head start in military applications of the new technology. The experience from early test programs served the Nazi ballistic missile effort well in the years to come. Trials of these small-scale A4s and A5s laid a firm foundation for the development of the full-scale A4, which soon became known as the V2. Following initial tests at a range near Borkum, all major ballistic missile programs were moved to Pinamunda. Here off the southern Baltic coast was a testing area some 290 miles long. Peripheral islands such as Ruden and Greifswalder Oya were also put to use. Pinamunda eventually became the largest and most sophisticated facility of its kind in the world and the breeding ground of some of Nazi Germany's most horrific weapons. Smaller artillery type rockets were not overlooked by the Luftwaffe planners. The 15 centimeter rocket and its Nebelwerfer 41 launcher were all too well known by Allied infantrymen. Cheap to manufacture, rugged and easy to transport, the system had an incredibly high rate of fire and fearsome destructive power. The weapon's six barrels could be fired and reloaded in under 90 seconds. Equipped with six 51-inch long barrels, the launcher was usually towed by a three-ton truck. The rockets, with a range of about 4.4 miles, were fired at two-second intervals. American GIs called them screaming memes and each was just over three feet long and weighed between 70 and 80 pounds. The propulsion unit consisted of seven sticks of diethylene glycol dinitrate, ignited electrically from a remote control box. These deadly rockets were delivered to the front in individual wooden boxes. When fired, the 15 centimeter rockets made a dreadful droning sound that many Allied servicemen would never forget. The weapon also left a distinctive trail of smoke, an Achilles heel that quite often drew fierce artillery and mortar fire from enemy guns. Fiesler's pulse jet powered V1 never had that kind of problem. Its long range made the launch point extremely difficult to ascertain. At the heart of the V-1 was a pair of spherical air bottles. These supplied the power for the gyroscopes, autopilot and fuel injection system. Valves directed the air to its various destinations. An electrical interface and pneumatic system controlled the V-1 in flight. Twin pneumatic servos moved the control surfaces. This pneumatic servo system was actuated by the autopilot. The V-1 was moved by hand onto the cradle and launch rail. Once in position, a compressed air hose and electrical connection were the only umbilicals required. With an explosive shove, the missile was moving at 360 feet per second by the time it left the ramp. A three-position switch ignited the jet and kicked in the catapult system. The switch, when moved to the intermediate position, pushed the pulse jet to maximum throttle. Seven seconds later, pressure in the catapult became intense enough to shear off a six millimeter holding pin, releasing the missile support cradle. In less than a second, the deadly flying bomb was airborne. Its flight profile was simple, virtually a straight line from launch to destination, which made the V-1 vulnerable. But once over the target, with its fuel shut off, it began its earthward dive.
With the push of a button, thousands of V-1s were launched from hundreds of sites scattered across Nazi-occupied territory. The Argus AS-109 pulse jet engine was essentially a welded steel tube with an inlet grille supporting a set of spring-loaded steel flaps. Between the flaps were atomizers which sprayed fuel into the combustion chamber. A spark plug ignited the fuel as it was injected. This created a sound that was unforgettable for the many Dutch and British citizens who survived V-1 attacks. The Argus engine was first tested in flight on April the 30th, 1941, on a DFS-230 glider. Initial trials verified the power plant's viability and low-speed performance. Still other tests were conducted using a Gotha G0145 biplane. A single Argus pulse jet was mounted underneath the aircraft and hinged at one end to provide enough clearance during takeoff and landing. Engine performance was monitored from the rear cockpit during flight. A Messerschmitt ME-110 was also flown with an Argus pulse jet. Messerschmitt also built the ME-328, which was one of the few manned aircraft ever to fly solely by pulse jet power. This rare footage almost certainly depicts the prototype V-1 prior to its first flight. It differed significantly from the production model. The pulse jet engine intake, its overall size, its fuselage configuration, and conventional empennage type control surfaces were all quite unlike the final V-1. Much smaller than the production missile, it served only to prove that unmanned flight using a pulse jet power plant was possible. The combustion process was not easily tamed. An exhaustive test program, including the creation of this static test component used to observe the combustion pulse, would eventually result in a functional and relatively dependable power plant. Slats fed air into the combustion chamber and closed during the combustion process, then opened to let in new air. This occurred at an incredibly high speed and led to the buzzing noise that gave it the infamous name, the buzz bomb. The rocket left a trail of flame. Visible from great distances, it often revealed the missile to Allied interceptors. Air launching the V-1 was attempted under combat conditions for the first time in April 1944. Extensive testing, some from the Heinkel HE-111, had established air launching as a feasible alternative. A number of HE-111s were modified for the job. This mode of launching increased the buzz bomb's effective range and lessened its reliance on fixed launch sites. The V-1's descent to target was rapid and eerily silent. Once the pulse jet shut off, the missile dived without further warning. The V-1's 1,870 pound warhead was coldly effective, easily destroying large structures and taking payment in the blood of civilians caught in its maelstrom. Well over 8,000 V-1s were launched during the course of the war. And in one nine-month period, nearly 2,500 hit London, killing more than 6,000 civilians. Speed was its main defense against interception. Anti-aircraft artillery served as the first line of defense. Hitting the V-1, which normally cruised at around 360 miles an hour, was difficult, but not impossible. A direct hit was not necessary. A shrapnel could disable the missile or render its delicate control system inoperative. Even when the missile was hit, its flaming debris was a hazard. Several British radar systems met with considerable success in detecting the terror weapons at great distance. These units gave the people of Antwerp and the anti-aircraft crews awaiting the incoming V-1s essential warning of the attack. Gunners could at least prepare for the onslaught. Some success was had in using radar as a gun aiming system. The V-1 with no pilot to take evasive action 
was perfect as a target in these situations. Perhaps most important, night attacks by V1s, though still terrifying, were no longer unpredictable. And intended targets could be geometrically ascertained before even seeing the missile's approach. Even with efforts to counter them, the buzz bomb attacks were fearsome. Thousands were recorded, but defenses improved gradually, and in all, only a quarter of the missiles ever reached their targets. No one was immune. V-1 pulse jet engines growled over England daily. Evelyn War called them, quote, as impersonal as the plague. The B-1's predictable flight path and relatively low speed were its Achilles' heel. Frequently fighter units were sent up to intercept, including the British Meteor jet. After the war, captured V-1s were put to use by Allied rocket experts. The rocket was fueled and the pulse jet ignited just before takeoff. A V-1 launch was a spectacular event, creating a massive cloud of smoke and flame. This is the rare Fiesler Fi-103R manned V-1. It was designed for suicide attacks, and there were only test flights by war's end. Manned, high-performance rocket-powered interceptors like the Messerschmitt Me-163 Comet offset attempts by the Argus company to convince the Luftwaffe that their ramjet-powered fighter was a viable alternative. The extraordinarily high speeds achieved by the tiny, tailless fighter were never equal during the war. And the comet's acceleration rates were amazing, even by today's standards. This interceptor gave rise to the basic plan for Messerschmitt's Enzian ground-to-air missile. Unlike its larger manned cousin, it was made primarily of wood and was launched with four Schmidding 109 solid fuel rocket engines grouped symmetrically around the fuselage. Within lay a Walter RI-210B sustainer rocket engine. The missile was launched from a modified 88mm gun platform equipped with special rails and was guided to its target via radio link. Pinamunda was a remote fishing village on an island in the Baltic Sea. Werner von Braun's grandfather hunted duck there. But by 1939, it was the world's largest rocket center. With liquid oxygen plants, cavernous workshops, hangars and wind tunnels, nearly 4,000 German engineers and scientists lived on its beaches. Thousands of others, foreign workers and slave laborers, provided the manpower needed to keep its massive operation going and produce Hitler's new vengeance weapons against the Allies. Amazingly, in spite of Allied control of the air, the facility remained hidden from prying enemy eyes for over three years. US studies began almost as soon as the V-1 entered service in 1944, and the work resulted in the Ford Republic loom less than a year later. Replica launch installations originally built to explore the best means of destroying German facilities were later modified to test American missiles. At first, the loom used the same launch method as the V-1. When shoved into the firing tube, the piston was sealed into place to prevent leakage. After that, the starter trolley, with its gas generator, was moved into position. This launch failed, probably because of a control or propulsion system malfunction. Another launch fares better. The dolly and piston separate from the missile less than a second after it leaves the rail. 
Both were retrievable and reusable. The pencil-thin Rheinmetall Vorsig Rheinbolter was one of the first weapons of its kind and betokened a new technology, the multi-stage rocket. This army weapon, designed to carry an 88-pound warhead nearly 100 miles, was supposed to replace the field artillery gun. The first of four solid fuel stages had six fins and seven exhaust nozzles and generated over 83,000 pounds of thrust, burning out in just one second. It was launched either from a mobile trailer or from a modified flak gun carriage. The missile was elevated to a predetermined position, dictating range and heading. Each of the Rheinbolter's stages was equipped with six sharply swept fins. These created aerodynamic forces that spun the missile slowly, stabilizing it in flight. Each stage was ignited in sequence by a charge fired as the preceding stage burned out. Other than the first stage, each had only one exhaust nozzle. The Rheinbotter was not guided remotely, but like an artillery shell, was entirely dependent on initial targeting. The most advanced ballistic weapon was undoubtedly the A4 rocket, or V2, the second of Hitler's vengeance weapons. At the tip of its 46-foot frame was a devastatingly effective one-ton warhead. Easily transported to camouflaged launch sites scattered across Europe, its mobility made it a more elusive target than the V1. More accurate than the V1, it was nearly ten times as fast and defense against it was hopeless. Launch sites needed only a launch base unit and a small number of support vehicles. Fueling could be done on site. A mobile control room was equipped with heavy armor plating. Inside was a manned control panel connected to the missile. Throughout 1941 and 1942, exhausted testing was carried out, and by the end of 1942, the terror weapon was finally successfully launched. Under Walter Dornberger's direction, the V-2 program moved ahead rapidly. But it wasn't an easy road. Technical difficulties were compounded by the Führer's view that the missile was a scientific triumph, but not a lethal weapon of modern warfare. A series of failures preceded the V-2's first flight. Support personnel were killed, and equipment was destroyed. The greatest source of frustration came from problems with the stabilization and steering systems for the huge rockets. Damage wasn't limited to the research facility. Here, a misdirected V-2 combustion chamber landed in the middle of a German airfield packed with HE-111 bombers. Launch stand failures with missiles full of volatile propellants led to spectacular explosions never to be forgotten by those who saw them. The V-2 was hurtled skyward by the largest rocket engine of its day. Fueled by liquid oxygen and alcohol, it produced a thrust of 55,125 pounds lasting about 68 seconds. The missile's maximum trajectory, at its greatest height, was approximately 60 miles. Flight time from liftoff to target impact was just under four minutes. The weapon's thrust-to-weight ratio approached two to one. After engine ignition, the V-2 ran for several seconds before actually taking to the air. But once it cleared the launch pad, acceleration was rapid. Automated controls, thrust vectoring and aerodynamic forces on the fins kept the missiles on course during the remainder of its flight.
In an attempt to extend the V2's 189 mile range, the A4B was developed. It was equipped with large swept wings, and only two were ever flight tested before the program was cancelled. The first launch wasn't a resounding success. Some 6,000 B-2s were built before the war's end. Of these, about 3,000 were launched against Allied targets. 1,054 landed in England, and another 1,675 hit targets in continental Europe. Though London was at first considered the primary target, Antwerp in Belgium was eventually the worst site of destruction. In all, the ancient city was struck by more than twice the number of B-2s that fell on London. After the war, captured B-2s were closely examined by U.S. intelligence teams and rocket experts. Missile parts were taken in huge numbers by conquering allies. Hundreds of finished V-2s were shipped to America and put to use in an expansive experimental flight test program. Beginning in April of 1946, missiles were launched from White Sands in New Mexico, Cape Canaveral in Florida, and from the deck of a U.S. Navy aircraft carrier. These endeavors led the way in establishing the fledgling U.S. ballistic missile program and a weapons race against the Soviets. In September 1947, a US V-2 was launched from the aft deck of the carrier Midway in the first shipborne test of the huge German missile. The flight was only partially successful, and the missile was intentionally destroyed at an altitude of one and a half miles. U.S. intercontinental ballistic missiles, like the Convair Atlas, can trace their design to the V-2. Another heir to the V-2 legacy was the Titan II, the most powerful liquid-fueled ICBM put into U.S. military service. The solid-fuel Minuteman I was yet another missile born of the V-2. With solid fuel, it could be stored for long periods, ready for launch at the push of a button. The advances made are chilling. They can carry multiple nuclear warheads 8,000 miles and destroy entire cities. In the modern world, the destructive powers of the V-1 and V-2 seem almost trivial. But their legacy is twofold. On the one hand, terrifying, and on the other, exhilarating but they've also led the way to the exploration of the cosmos. The scientific achievements they set in motion held humanity hostage, but in another way opened its eyes to new horizons. But the B-weapons were intended for the darker purpose, and their doomsday brethren of today are often justified by the words that eerily echo Hitler's own. If we had had these rockets in 1939, we should never have had this war 